So actually, we're going to keep you on um, to together with uh, Steve Wade, Gavin McNair, and Ivan Pedrasas for, for a Q&A session just now. So um, could everybody please come back? Um, I'll read off some questions from, from Slack, and we can have a discussion. Um, I, I will be the moderator um, for, for now. <laughs> Is Tiffany there? Um, Hi, sorry. <laughs> oh, perfect. Great. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have grid view. I don't know why. Oh, no, it's good. Um, cool. Uh, so welcome back, everybody. Thank you all for this really illuminating talks. Um, the first really direct question that I saw um, in Slack uh, is coming from, coming from Andreas Diego. And it was for Ivan. Um, he says, thanks for a nice presentation. Could you please share the link to the multi-stage Docker files you mentioned? He spotted a certain link, but it doesn't seem like the one you mentioned. Oh, I guess um, he's also a big fan of putting steps into a Docker file instead of using many GitLab CI steps or GitHub actions, but the world seems to go in a different direction here. <laughs> Well, maybe you can push the worlds back in your direction. Indeed, um, um, I'll, I'll share I'll share the slides. I don't know what's the best way. I'll, I'll send it to to you guys. I'll put it in my Twitter. Uh, and I think that. Uh, that yeah, if if you could also post it um, post it in in the Slack or 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 I can. Um, that's okay. not a problem. Um, uh, okay. Um, so. Uh, Tama is writing to me. There is a question from Steve about his own talk, uh, um, just about asking Steve uh, to discuss what what were the difficult parts of, of the GitOps journey? What are the most difficult parts of the GitOps journey? Yeah, so I think in, in the presentation that Gavin and I gave, it was very much that the happy clappy, this is all working, but there were some bits that didn't work. Um, so I think the the most difficult part of the journey was around um, the developers understanding that they were going to get less privileges right to the Kubernetes cluster. So in, in previous incarnations of the platform, they were essentially cluster admins, they could see everything, they could delete everything, they could deploy everything. Um, and then when you tell them you're only going to get read only, um, all hell breaks loose. Um, so a lot of the difficulty there was kind of hearts and minds, right? The, the tech is the easy part, it's the people problems that are, are the most um, difficult. So for me personally, it would be that journey of showing them the power of GitOps and what it can provide and how they need to relinquish some control and how they'll give control to an automated process. Gavin, do you have anything else that you want to say from that? Yeah. Um use good processes in the first place. If uh, if they never have the access, then you never have to take it away. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, they, they'd run rampant on, on our environment before we ever started. So um, it was, you know, the cat was out of the bag. Oh, well, that's an interesting point also, just in terms of legibility of, of code within deployment repos, like, setting up some kinds of readmes and setting expectations or what what are those standards going to be socially moving forward we will have to set them um cool uh, so um other people in the slack uh were just wondering to hear from the speakers about any tips tricks or pitfalls um when doing GitOps with helm or using helm with flux is anyone keen to talk about that Come on, Steve. <laughs> um, some tips for me would be, well, we kind of alluded to one in the presentation, right? You don't start with a single Helm operator that can deploy multiple Helm releases. Um, but when you get too far, that's going to become pretty slow. Um, so move to kind of this um, multi-tenanted approach where you have a, a Helm operator per namespace. And if you kind of think of namespaces as, as products, you may have a product team. So maybe you have a Flux instance there for that product team. You have a Helm operator there for that product team. And then finally, you have um, the, the Helm releases themselves. And I think from a kind of getting started guide, there's multiple steps or kind of phases to, to getting started with this. I think 
the the CI around your Helm charts is going to really help you. Um, getting getting that set up, getting your kind of um, Helm registry in a position whereby you can constantly keep uploading new um, new charts. And then in terms of um, kind of actually onboarding those, start with something that's really really simplistic, right? So at, at Meta we started with something that we called the ingress verifier and all it did was essentially deploy a deployment with a service and an ingress and you hit the url and it returns you back saying it worked right it's very very trivial um, and you can take that from straight yaml get it working move it to a helm chart get the ci in there and upload the registry move that to a helm release that flux is going to pick up and then see it happening right and then you kind of got a pattern and then it's a case of the next step is really about image changes. So how do you perform image updates and what's the process that you, you're gonna do for that? And then once you've got those two bits of the puzzle kind of nailed down, um, it's a case of just kind of rinse and repeat, right? To add your different, um, different components. The kind of one other thing I would probably say is just bypass, if you're starting this journey from scratch, just bypass like Helm V2, like the amount of pain that thing caused is unbelievable. Um, just go straight to Helm 3 and, uh, save yourself some receding hairline and some headaches. <laughs> I can, that's, a, I, that's a very good tip. I can add a couple of Go things on. there with Helm. Please. And I, I think it's very important for people to understand the artifact. There's just Helm does not follow the same cycle and unification. So like you have to understand to separate. The other thing is about don't construct really complex Helm chats. It's much easier to have two or three and then think about the versioning of the Helm chat and the implications of that versioning in your, in your workflow. So like you have to understand these things and what, what the tip says is, is spot on. But yeah, it's Helm chat is, is another artifact that you have to use. And I think that the, the good thing that we have, particularly with flags, is that you have the Helm release which separates the values from, from the chat, which helps hugely for developers to understand that, that the Helm chart is an artifact on its own that helps to deploy the application, right? Just that. Yeah, along that line of Helm as well, it's um, when you use a lot of the official Helm charts, a lot of them are designed to cater to everybody's requirements. So they can be extremely complicated. And if you're only trying to do something simple, it's actually not that much work to build your own. I mean. If, you, if the upstream looks good and works, that's great. But if what you're doing is the simplest possible thing, there's no, there's no sh shame in building a Helm chart. I, th I think kind of one more thing that I would uh, kind of al allude on and kind of back on to, um, to what Ivan says was the, the Helm chart is really the abstraction that the developer needs to understand for onboarding their application. So they really need to understand that values file, right? They don't, they're not all going to be Kubernetes experts and neither do they have to be, but they need to understand that declarative values file and how making changes to that file makes changes to what actually gets deployed. So at, at Metal, in the beginning, every application had its own Helm chart, right? Loads of inconsistency, loads of different label taxonomies, you know, it was a complete mess. So what we did is we worked with the developers created a single backend Helm chart that had toggles and switches that they all understood with a nice readme in the, in the Helm chart. Um, and then they now use that backend Helm chart when they are creating a new microservice or a new Helm release. And because they understand that readme, they are now in control of that Helm chart. And for them to onboard new microservices now is very, very simplistic because they just have to go to the readme, understand the toggles and apply the changes. So I think consistency is key. Makes sense. Um, okay, so we've got actually another question for, for Tiffany. Um, this person was asking, Mark Pim was asking, with the branch for environment set up, how do you manage environment specific config that should not be promoted between branches? I've been considering that approach, but wondering about people blindly merging devs to prod and overriding some prod settings. Actually, yes. I have a similar question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. Um, and certainly um, the pipelines that we used, um, specifically Azure pipelines, um, 
you know, there was some amount of um, environment variables specific to each environment that we were um, in, including in the pipeline. Um, and as I mentioned as well, um, you know, what would be deployed, what would end up being deployed to each environment was really, um, you know, accomplished by the instance of flux within that cluster. And that instance of flux was pointed specifically to um, a dev branch, a stage branch, a prod branch. So um, I think that previous speakers have also talked about some of the security aspects of GitOps um, and certainly helps to achieve those results. And I'm sorry, I didn't unmute fast enough um, when we were talking about the uh, about Helm, but um, one additional uh, recommendation that I tend to give is, um, you know, certainly you, you might be, you might consider writing your own Helm charts, but even when you're using public Helm charts, um, we do recommend that you fetch and untar them and then store them in a Git repository that's perhaps even dedicated to your Helm charts. Um, and, you know, you're also able to host your own um, Helm registry. And so you're less dependent on the public charts being available all the time. Um, and you can see, um, you know, Git diffs when there are updates to be made to those Helm charts. Um, just as an additional thought. That's can, a good point. I, Thank you, Sophie. I can add something to the, to the question about the resources. It's just something I, I mentioned in my talk about, about understanding the hierarchy of the objects. And, and if you try to solve everything with one flux and one repo, it gets a little bit tricky. But the solution is just like use two, two fluxes, for example, pointing to two different repos, one that configures a cluster and the other one that configures configures the application running in that cluster, right? Like two or more than two fluxes slash repos. Repos or branches, it doesn't really matter that much, but it's about the promotion of the of the branch and how you want to manage that, that repo, right? So usually what we have is two different repos, one that configures the environment, one that configures the cluster, one that configures the application. So three, three fluxes there. And there's no limit on how many fluxes you want to run. Like Steve was talking about, one flux per namespace is a really nice, a really nice um, pattern, particularly if you see namespaces as virtual clusters, right? So think think about more about, about this way. How do you want to segregate and which which resources belong to the cluster and which resources belongs to the application or to the environment, right? That's it. We actually saw that in Tiffany's example, and that was more my question. So first she had uh, um, a deployment repo that had just different uh, folders in it, one for prod, one for staging, and one uh, one for dev. Um, and, and then she transitioned that into separate repos. So when is that point? When do you hit that? Yeah, and um, I'm realizing now that maybe I didn't make it um, clear enough, but what I was describing uh, mostly had to do with you know, the deployment of applications, um, and that's what was stored in our deployment repository. In terms of cluster provisioning and infrastructure management, we used Terraform to accomplish those goals. Um, and so, you know, um, for the Terraform users out there, you're familiar with, you know, the Terraform plan, the Terraform apply. Um, and so, you know, again, everything is still uh, declarative. Uh, declaratively described and all of your desired state is in the Terraform cluster infrastructure repository. Um, and then what I was describing with the deployment repository then housed all of the things that had to do with applications. Um, and uh, to answer your question, Bianca, um, we always had separate branches per cluster or environment. So in the dev branch was only things that were meant to be deployed to the dev cluster. In staging and prod, uh, they were completely separated out as well. So hopefully that uh, sheds a bit more light. Okay, yeah, that's right. I, I had actually um, misunderstood that, but yes, thank you. Um, there is one last question coming from David Lars. He's curious to hear if the presenters have thoughts on how to give devs a good starting point for building greenfield apps like build packs or similar. 
or if they had to come up with their own Docker files from scratch. So he gives like Spotify backstage as an example of a project that's really focused on giving devs an opinionated and good starting point and wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. We do. By the way, look, we provide the Docker file, we provide the Helm chat and we provide the Helm release. I think like it, it depends a little bit on, on the teams and, and the situations, but um, at least they have something they can look at and say, okay, now I understand. But it's to the to the point that the C was making earlier about about the interface that you have between your application and the system, the platform, which is the the Helm release values, right? Like that that is the core of of what they have to do. They know how to build the application. They don't know how to so much how to deploy. Right. So by giving them a Docker file and and the Helm chat. And, and what we do is as well, keeping them the pipelines. So, so they just do git push and then magically <laughs> the thing is built, it's been pushed and then Helm, Helm is deployed um, using the, the flux operator and, and the automation, right? So, so for them, the, the user experience is I do git push and, and my application will end up in the cluster. Yeah, I think it is. Sorry. I was going to say, I think it's important that you do give devs ownership of that part. So one of the things we did a lot was to work with the developers and say, we've got a Docker file here as an example, but you guys manage it because we're not responsible for their Docker containers. You know, they, they build them and um, they deploy them. It's just they deploy them to the cluster that we've put together. I, I think kind of an, an interesting point that may not have been touched on is this this understanding and notion that Kubernetes is eventually consistent, right? So everyone just creates their Helm release, deploys it and goes, why is it not working? Why is it not working? Like, I can't connect, I can't connect. And they actually have to understand that it's going to try its best to get in the state that you've declared it, but it may not actually ever get there. So one of the things that we created at Metal was um, a container image called Perimineer, which is essentially Greek for weight. Um, and was an init container that we had as part of our backend chart that allowed you to wait for things that you were dependent on. So if you depended on a specific Kafka topic, there's really no point in the application starting because it's just gonna like hemorrhage logs all over the place because it doesn't have the thing that it depends on. And they had the ability to be able to configure um, what they were waiting on because we had consistent naming conventions across all of our pods with specific labels. It was a very simplistic way for them to be able to say, I depend on, on this microservice. Um, and what that allowed us to be able to do is from nothing, bootstrap the whole cluster and the pieces of the puzzle would come together when their dependencies were ready. Thank, thank you, um, Steve. We, we've actually got to close the question and answer session now because we're at time. Um, but uh, I really do encourage you guys to stick around on the Slack um, for audience members to continue the conversation um, with you as much as they can. Um, thank you all again uh, for speaking. Um, and I would like to call up our DJ Desired State again to <laughs> take us into a short break. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.